Hello, my name is Min Jung Kim, and I'm the director and CEO of the New Britain Museum of American Art. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture, where dance meets visual art, creating color fields by Judy Dorn and members of the Judy Dorn Performance Project. The program explores the evolution of color fields, a remarkable work of dance, movement, and music inspired by artworks in our current exhibition, Helen Frankenthaler Late Works, 1990 to 2003. Organized in collaboration with the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation and curated by Douglas Streichbroom, this exhibition marks the first museum presentation dedicated to the late work of Helen Frankenthaler, who is recognized as one of the most innovative and influential artists of the 20th century. Helen Frankenthaler Late Works is part of the museum's 2020 20 Plus Women at NBMAA initiative, celebrating the invaluable contribution of artists to the women to the arts, which is sponsored by Stanley Black and Decker with additional support from Bank of America. It has truly been incredible to witness the evolution of color fields from its earliest rehearsals to the ambitious suite of music, choreography, live performance, and video that is now in development. We are immensely grace grateful to the Judy Dorn Performance Project for the rich and engaging cross-disciplinary collaboration and applaud the entire ensemble for your visionary work. I thank everyone for joining us today. And throughout today's lecture, if you have any questions or comments, please do feel free to use the chat function to type in your questions, which we will address after Judy's lecture. Without further ado, I am pleased to turn over today's program to Judy Doran. Thank you, Min. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here, and it's been wonderful to be part of this partnership and to, um, we could not have asked for a better partner in the New Britain Museum of American Art. And from beginning to end, it really has been incredible. And also the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation, who have really, cooperated in ways in many, many details and, um, and have just been very willing to be there with us and for us and at our open rehearsals as have been the New Britain Museum staff. So we've just been very appreciative. We're also um, thank, thanking the Roberts Foundation, the Long Foundation, American Savings Bank, the Community Foundation of Greater New Britain and Wesleyan University for their support as well. So. I'm gonna start out, it's really quite wonderful to have this opportunity to kind of bring this process into some kind of um, cohesive lens um, because it's been a process that has evolved in surprising ways throughout its time and in wonderful ways. Um, and I'm gonna start by just saying a little bit about myself as an artist, just very little bit, just that um, because it has a strong relationship to Helen and it's something that I discovered along the way. Um, for myself as, as a dance theater artist, I started out very much as um, someone who was performing solo or in with musicians, but solo, solo dance performer, um, working improvisationally in capturing the moment of um, and expressing that in the moment. And at a certain point in, um, in the 1980s, I, I felt that I'd kind of gone that route, but I was really interested in creating work that um, with a group of people and that had a life as, as a piece and that with improvisation as the route to the work, but, um, but really shaping it. And so that it could be performed in that way, but never in that way, because there's always that sense of infusing it with that present moment of performance in new ways. And so um, I wanted to create a, a, a company, a group of artists that would, would work with me as a collaborative team. And in that sense, not looking for dancers that would do something that I would bring in the room and, and, and give to them, but rather that I would give ideas, structures, music, and, um, and there would be experimentation and exp exploration among everyone. And I would be the outside eye kind of seeing what worked um, and, and asking that to be pulled back and remembering it and beginning to shape it into something that became a cohesive whole. So, um, the skill of the company was to confuse, uh, to remember what they had done. And that's that there's a kind of dual process going on because one needs to be totally in the moment, but also in one's mind watching that moment. 
<clears throat> so that it's possible to recapture it afterwards. And so um, this is a skill that develops over time and has, and I've worked many of the, the dancers, most of the dancers that, that are in the company have worked with the company for a very long time. Some, um, one, one in particular since it began. And Kathy Bortek Gerson, who's now Associate Artistic Director um, and sits outside with me, um, but was a, a brilliant performer for many, many years. So um, I think that, that that was one of the first wonderful discoveries in, in kind of diving into Helen's work and to her ideas about doing work was that she also had that really strong respect and um, for, for improvisation. And so there's a slide that um, I think of, of a quote of hers and I, it's, it's just beautiful. I think one hopes every picture will be a new birth, a fresh experience within a growing framework. One prepares bringing all one's weight and gracefulness and knowledge to bear, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, physically. And often there's a moment when all frequencies are right and it hits. And this is so resonant with what we do. One produces the moment and hopes to have the ability to let that moment guide from there. So it's this wonderful dialogue where as the piece unfolds, you're listening to the piece. You guide it and it guides you. Every picture, something of an experiment. And I could replace the word picture with dance and it would, it would very much say the process that, um, that, that, is, that works for me. And um, so I, 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 one way in which Helen and I are somewhat are, diverge a little bit is that my work has been, um, an underpinning of my work has been social justice. I, I really feel that the arts and performance are an important vehicle to in some, encourage social change and to bring forward um, issues that are going on in our culture that are, um, that, that are not, not terrific to say mildly, and, um, and how to bring those forward in ways that reach people viscerally um, in their hearts, in their minds, and in their spirit to, um, to want to move in some other direction. So, um, so I think that, that that's been there. I've used text as in, in the more recent years, um, text has been an increasingly increasing um, partner in the work. Um, I, I sometimes write text, I enjoy writing text and also um, people that I'm working with who have written um, text as well. But another common thread in this, and this is a link to um, Helen as well, is that there's always been a visual component to the work, visual elements that, um, and Marcella Oteza, who's here um, and has been the visual director of this piece, um, we've worked together for, for many years and um, she has been a, a wonderful collaborator in this process, starts very early on. And with these visual elements that change their meaning changes, um, according to how, it, how they're used in the piece. And, and the pieces tend to be narrative, but imagistically so. So it's not telling a story that, that takes place in a linear fashion most often, but that there's a series of images that, that portray something that becomes a story. So um, right now we'd like to show some examples of that visual imagery so that it puts this work in, in a context of where it's come from. Yeah. So Tub is the first piece and Tub is a piece that, um, th that was about a, a woman um, removing herself from the male gaze and she's immersed in um, a tub that lights from the bottom and, um, and travels up. And this is Kathy Bortek Gerson who um, perform I used to perform this piece myself and Kathy did it beautifully in um, a retrospective that we had celebrating 30 years um, of JDPP. In This House was a piece that um, from 2011, it focused on a house in New London, the Hampstead House, which at one point housed a slave. Um, it uses these windows that Marcella created and, um, and the chairs, um, the, the windows are on wheels and they, the way they're moved in the space <clears throat> creates different locations and <clears throat> excuse me, environments. And the piece really spoke about slavery in Connecticut and the whole issue of racism. 
and there you get a very clear sense of how they were used in, in terms of, uh, of creating worlds. <clears throat> Meditations from a Garden Seat is a piece that came out of work at your correctional institution. We started working at the State Prison for Women in 2005 and with the permission of um, Department of Correction began taking some of the work out to the public. And here you see, we used, um, we juxtaposed the voice of Harriet Beecher Stowe with the voices of women at York. And there, the theme was gardens and Marcella created um, these wonderful boxes, garden boxes, and the dancers used them in different ways. Uh, Lighthouse, Lighthouse was a piece that was kind of an origin piece in, in very early on and then we redid it in 2015. And it uses ladders and, um, and nets to, and the piece was really about the overtaking of, of, of our culture by technology and um, how to preserve that, this sort of island of preservation of, of what, what's really important about our humanity. Um, so this gives glimpses of how the ladders were used in, in, in different ways. And again, they're all, they become dancers in the space. And um, I love seeing the ways that can happen. Raven in New World is a piece that came out of the prison as well. Um, it looked at um, various issues of incarceration. Um, we use these open frame boxes um, that Marcel also um, designed and um, they became here, they're um, replicating a bus as a woman talks about her uh, re-entry into the community. Um, so they were used, they were, they were wonderful and we plan to reuse uh, them again in a performance coming up in the fall. Yeah. And finally, U.S. It's a piece about immigration that we did in 2017. It was a collaboration with the Hartford Public Library, which is a hub in Hartford for immigration. And you can see that suitcases were the element, vintage suitcases, all with very different personalities. And also the space itself became um, the visual element. And we, we traveled through the library um, and audience traveled with us as we um, kind of told this imagistic story of immigration in our country. We moved it to the stage, um, Theater of Performing Arts in Hartford. And um, here you see that the, um, the visual elements became also included projections, which Marcella designed. Yeah. So now I'm gonna um, turn this over to Marcella to talk a little bit about, because we're moving on now to Helen and I'm gonna have Marcella introduce herself and talk a little bit. Hi, hi everybody, thank you, Judy. So one of the things that has been really exciting for me to work with Judy over the years, actually since 2011, the, the piece that has the windows, is the way in which we incorporate the idea of the objects and how the objects also become um, another performer in the space. So to me, in order to um, really create these environments or have a, a conversation with the dancers, what I'm looking for is objects that could be moved, could re be reinvented, and in a way, helping create a piece that is a sculpture in movement, right? So the objects in themselves don't tell a story and the bodies in themselves and the choreography tell something else, but by putting it together, you create this sense of a storytelling and then uh, an understanding of the space that is in, in permanent state of change and that you're actually moving forward um, your ideas, right? So. In one hand, you have this idea of incorporating an object, which uh, we usually come uh, to a decision with Judy after conversations and conceptualization of what is the idea behind these objects. And then we br I bring it to the space, and this is the perfect moment, right? Because the dancers always do things or transform the objects in a way that we were not expecting. And the piece grows immediately with the partnership between the object and the dancer. 
The other thing that to me is really important in the work that I do is the under understanding of a space. I've been trained as a painter first and then as a set designer. So a space for me is itself a character. So when we do site specific work, like the one that we did in the library, I'm always thinking, what is the audience performance relationship? Do I want to do diagonals? Do I want to have distance? Do I want to establish a power structure in which I'm telling the story even without knowing that there has been a, des a design decision made in the space, right? But we're trying to guide the audience and make it understand and see the pieces with certain lenses and cer certain directionalities, which actually, again, helps to tell the story. And so does the video. Like, for instance, in us and the, the, the piece in the Hartford Library, we have the videos going also with flags as well as music going at the same time. So there is that uh, intervention to the space that is happening even though it's occupying as a public space, but we're also hinting at something and allow different points of entry to the performance, which is really important for site this specific work. Um, and yeah, I think that's what I wanna say for the moment. Okay, thanks Marcella. So um, now this brings us to Helen. And so we, in some ways we can see Helen as a, as a new path as, you know, but I think that in some ways, um, it she the, her work and this project took on its own kind of social justice significance in that it was such a healing um opportunity not only for us but for people who came to see us as we lived through this pandemic and the darkness of the pandemic her her work brought a light um in a way that was was unexpected in terms of the power of its um of its grounding, anchoring, and healing nature. Um, so I just start, we had one rehearsal all together for this, for Color Fields. Um, and, and that was, and, and I introduced, talked to the company about where we were gonna head. Um, and, and, and then we started to improvise with some, um, some of the paintings that were gonna be used in the exhibit. And one in particular, um, which is Untitled 1996, um, which there we go, there it is. Um, I showed this and, and, and everybody be, um, started and it became one of those improvisations that is that aha moment where it's that moment that, that um, Helen talked about in, in that quote, where you, you just know it's completely right and there isn't anything more. It has just said what it needs to say. And, um, and so we had that moment with this, it went on for, for some time and it was just at the end, everybody kind of, you, everyone knew. And then in that, in this process, you just do know. And we said, well, okay, well, well next week we'll, we'll, we'll really take this and, re, and shape it, come back to it and find a way to, to, to save it. And of course, next week never happened in the studio again um, because COVID was here and we all, went off to our homes and, um, and, and saw each other the next time on Zoom. And I think that this painting in some ways becomes emblematic of that moment in the sense that you see these little compartments, um, these, these closed spaces, and it feels like um, that's kind of where we all went, but, but there's still co this color coming out of them. And, and there's this wonderful blue sort of, um, um, squiggling kind of um, design in, in the corner. And Doug Dreischling talked about that in his, his description of this painting when he, in, in his second lecture. And this idea of the constricted space, but there's still the sense of, of stepping out of the bounds of freedom. Um, and to me, that blue, in, in, in thinking about this in terms of our process, that blue um, sense of freedom was what we had and what was the kind of connective tissue of where we went from here. So um, it has a kind of special um, sense to me. Um, I think also that the thing that I think is, is, is where I found a kind of convergence between Helen and I was um, the sense of, she does go into the dark. Her, that slide that we just saw, there's a lot of dark there. And at the exhibit, there, there's maybe a half of the room that are, are paintings that are quite dark and the other half that's quite light and it's kind of a diagonal and it's, um, it's, it's, it's really beautifully laid out. And um, I think that always in Helen's dark, 
there's some light. You do always see some little sense of, of color of that. And, and to me, that's there is that sense of hopefulness. And I maybe am putting that on because of the time that we've lived through. But I think that's also characteristic of my own work that I, I, I delve into dark things and I'm interested to do that and to, and to take the deep dive. And, um, and, and it's sometimes, a, a tr you know, it's a troubling process to go there, but, and I invite audiences to go there with me and with, with everybody who's created this work. But um, I think also there is a sense of hope that comes out at the end and not a Pollyanna idea of hope but of having traveled that route and come through, because I think creating work in and of itself is, is, is a statement of hope. Um, and so within that, um, and I'm interested in creating something that is also beautiful, that's very dark, but is also very beautiful. And I think that that is also characteristic of Helen's work as well. She, she says that she, in, in a statement, beautiful quote of hers, that um, she is interested in, um, in, in here we go, there it is, yay. All right, um, and I, what concerns me when I work is not whether the picture is a landscape or whether it's past, pastoral or whether somebody will see a sunset in it. What concerns me is, did I make a beautiful picture? And I think, um, I mean, I think Helen's work is so layered with, more, with, with the things that one would describe beyond beauty, but I think there is that sense of wanting to create something beautiful that I also understand. And, Beautiful does not mean easy or, um, um, yeah. So um, I think now we, we end up moving into the dialogue with, we, we, we kind of travel um, in a lot of different ways. We, we worked on Zoom, the dancers created work at home. We shared it on, on the video and critiqued it. We had open rehearsals that were incredibly um, helpful. And, um, and we worked outside, we worked at the Hillstead Museum um, and created a video out of that work there. We had three rehearsals together in the summer. We had three rehearsals in the fall at the uh, Walnut Hill Park across from the museum. So we had these six times that we were together creating and all these times that we were on Zoom creating. And, um, and then we walked into the gallery and, um, and, and, and there were the paintings and, a, di and a, a sense of having a real dialogue with those paintings. So that's kind of, was an, all of these moments were, were very, very powerful, I have to say. That became a sort of extremely powerful um, moment as well. And, um, and I'm gonna have Marcella talk a little bit about that and how she um, thought about the costumes. Yes, uh, hi everybody. Um, so one of the things that I think is important to think about the work that we were doing or the processes that we have encountered through the pandemic and with the working with Helen is that at the same time that we're in, Judy is thinking about the choreography and permanently thinking about the space and how we're dealing with the space. So through the work that we did in Zoom with the rehearsals, I kept thinking, it's like, oh my goodness, this is so contained by the frame Do we actually need to make a film out of this? Do we make a movie? Well, how are we going to deal when we move from the frame into the actual space? Because the idea of going into the gallery was always present. Initially, with the idea of the public space, because we thought that by the time it was going to happen, we actually will have an audience on um, in the museum walking about while the performance was going to happen. But of course, the pandemic didn't allow that, so it got separated. But one of the things is that these different processes created in a way, different ways to think of the work of Helen. So we have the, the virtual space in a way is the canvas, like this window to the space, uh, to, to the world of, of Helen and the layers of her paint and the textures and the lines were present and how that gets into the work that we are doing within the rooms of each one of the dancers, the way that they're moving, the way that they're using though this particular environment, which is the virtual. And then from there, we, go, we move into Hillstead, right? The natural space, we have depth of field, we have distance, which is also present in the work of um, Helen, right? The colors, the lines, the indication of landscape. And there we were with the bodies on the land, in the landscape, right? And how we can trace the line 
of uh, of chalk that we it was one of the ideas that we have when she talks about in, in her infancy in, when she was little Helen was little and she walks from the museum uh, to her house and the chalk line is also representing this sense of a space distance and connection between the the spaces in which she lives and in our case the virtual space the landscape and then the museum, how these are all connected. And there is a line through between improvisation, between chance encounters of different textures and colors and feels in the, in the Hillsdale, Hill, Hillsdale Park, as well as when we move them back into the, into the gallery and how these movements who were created in Zoom then get separated and transferred into the big landscape and then back into the gallery. And what it is that we choose to emphasize in terms of colors and shapes and relationship, right? So basically we're creating a process of relationship between a space, texture, line, color, the work of Helen and the bodies, the organic and the inorganic, the canvas is inorganic, but the, what is inside is organic. The same happen between the virtual space and then the landscape, the organic and inorganic, uh, having a conversation. Thanks, Marcella. Yeah, and, and I want to add to that, that there's also the feeling layer of Helen's paintings. I think they are really evocative of, of feeling, and I think she very generously offers that to us. I think that she went to real depths in her own um, at, at, of you know how she took things in and her sensitivity to that, and I think that that's there as an underpinning in the paintings as well, and something that um, that I think was was really palpable and that the dancers also really picked up on, as did I. Um, so we're going to now show you a little um, some of the experiments that we did that Marcella was talking about. Um, so you get some idea if you um, haven't been able to be at the open rehearsals, just some idea visually of, of what, what we did. So um, we're gonna start now with an experiment in gesture. Some of the earlier explorations I had done were with the ideas of nature. There were some quotes about her having, feeling like the landscape was in her arms when she was creating. The whole idea of improvisation and how we work and how connected that that was. I done an, uh, an improv to one of the paintings, kind of being in the painting, and then um, I just decided to try an experiment. Uh, it was a lot of fun to do. And now in these um, next um, clips, you'll see. Um, different members of the company experimenting with ideas of gesture, also working with different body parts. Um, again, small experiments, and we would create videos, the dancers would create videos that we would watch um, when we gather together on Thursdays. Yeah, and this quote um, of Helen's about being drawn to water. Um, I think that the quotes that I found, I shared with the company um, in the reading that I was doing about Helen pulled out different um, quotes and ideas. And um, Heidi was very moved um, to create this with gesture and with the idea of the water as an experiment. So um, the next one that we'll show is an experiment in nature. Um, again, we, we went outside and spent a, a great deal of time experimenting out there, both the company by themselves and then when we came together. I did a lot of improv um, using a rock in my backyard and I was really inspired by Helen's quote about being mesmerized by the clouds. I spent a lot of time just looking up and looking around um, at everything around me.
Okay, and the next one we're going to show is there were there are wonderful pictures, uh, photographs of Helen in the process of painting, and also there are two um, videos of her in the process of painting, which um, one of which I, I was only able to see through the kindness of the um, Helen Frankenthaler Foundation, and um, and so this was quite early on in the process. I, I invited the dancers to find. Um, to take three of those postures, three, of, and and also to feel the sense of of Helen um, it, as she moved, because she her work was she was so physical in the way that she she worked, um, and to put that into a phrase, and each each company member brought a phrase, and then we took parts of that out and created a, what we now call as the Helen Frankenthaler phrase, and it's been a through line in the project, and we've done it in a number of different settings and, and for the film at the Hillstead. So we're gonna just show very little part of that and give you a sense of the, um, how we put it into the sunken garden at the Hillstead. So, um, and then the last thing, last experiment we're gonna show is um, the idea of, of using buckets and fabric. Um, Heidi, who's a member of, of the company, um, did these experiments that were, that ultimately will be in the final outdoor piece that you'll see um, that some of you, if you feel, if you care to join us um, on May 13th, but um, here are, is bucket experiments and fabric. This was Heidi when she first started to work on this idea that she had, we had been talking about fabric and color and how we were going to bring color into So that um, that that all brings us to the gallery, and um, and we're going to show some clips of the gallery. But first, um, Marcel is going to talk a little bit more, um, and now bring in the costumes and um, where they are in the gallery and where they're going to be on the outside. I was rushing you before. <laughs> yes, hello. Yeah, I, I I skipped it because I remember our script, so I think it's it's good. So one of the things that I think is um, it was such an important moment when we walk into the gallery. We have been working with this, uh, with the uh, paintings in in the screen in the in, for such a long time that in a way we even myself, which I'm really good with dimensions, forgot the sizing of them, and all of a sudden they were all the same size. And then I remember walking in and realized, oh my goodness, there is these really big fields and these other small details that really integrate with all of the details in the gallery. So it was an important moment for all of us to get in there and be physically with the paintings. But in terms of the 
on the costume process. Um, what we did, each of us, the dancers were working with one or two, with two paintings actually that they have selected. And one of the things that I did over the, the time in which we were uh, working on them is sort of try to get colors who were, as we will call it, Helen colors without being the same colors of Helen, but think about surface and thinking about color fields and thinking about how that relationship could be brought into three-dimensionality with the body. So we developed these, co these costumes and dresses thinking in a color who was present in the, in the painting that the, the dancer had been chosen, but also an underlying color who was present in another painting of somebody else's. So in a way creating um, every single dress with a different color, but at the same time with a commonality that they connect between each other and they have the presence of the line, as you will see, but also they have the idea of the surface and their move and their become organic by the dancers. Um, yeah, so um, so now you'll be able to see the, the um, some snippets and here's from two of the dancers um, of the gallery encounters. And then um, on May 6th, we're creating a film of all of the dances that will be airing virtually um, that you'll be able to see. And um, I think I'm just gonna quickly mention this sort of uh, conversion to film because that was not some, the kind of original plan was um, that we, I mean, it would eventually be performed um, in a theater as we, um, in some way, but it wasn't clear where one. Um, and then it became that the, as COVID continued, um, how can we still do this piece no matter what? And we confronted that question numbers of times and, um, and the idea of creating a film. And so um, um, wonderful, wonderful videographer, PJ Brockett, came into, um, he, he filmed color fields and, and then came into the gallery. And so we have this, this wonderful, gallery of dances that we can um, share with you on, on May 6th. And so you'll see some little parts of that um, here. And I just wanna say one other quick thing about music because we worked with a composer from England that I um, met through on Zoom after um, hearing his music and to create these kind of soundscapes for the dances that, that it kind of created environments and that responded to the, the inspirations that, that, that Helen was responding to in her paintings. So you'll hear some of that as well. So this process was actually very different um, because I am used to being in a studio and I'm used to kind of creating sometimes in front of a mirror, sometimes not. And um, I feel like this really broke me out of my habits of having to be in a studio setting. So creating the dances in the park, creating the dances on a rock, creating the dances um, even just in my living room um, in front of my staircase. It's been a really, really nice process. Um, and it also has been very individualized because we are very used to um, moving together and finding inspiration together. So it's definitely been a little difficult at times, but I think overall it's been a very good um, kind of breakout point for me um, as an artist. When I also used the painting Airy, I had a totally different feel to it. I felt like when I was creating my movement, I was floating over a scene below me. And I spent a lot of time outside when I created that dance. I actually would go on nature walks and hikes and find the biggest rock that I could and stand on it and hover over and look over um, at the scene below me. And that's how I started to create that dance. So I've had a lot of inspiration from nature and also um, I was very inspired by the the placement of the paintings in the museum as well. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Rachel, and I am so grateful to have everyone watching. The painting that I did my piece to, the first piece, is called Kiss. And what drew me to that piece was being able to see a wash of blues and the depths of finding out more about Helen through that painting. What I've discovered about myself through that art is there's so much more. I didn't understand at first how to move with paint and what that was like. But now I've had a full understanding of being able to resonate with the art. With Kiss, I was able to see that there is shading, there is tones, there are, there's depth. And I didn't necessarily know how to present that. But working through Zoom and seeing and getting feedback, I was able to fully encompass what it is like to be a full round dancer and an artist and connecting those two things. For me, when I switched my painting from Unentitled 1993 to Homage, I was a little hesitant at first because there is so much that I didn't think I was able to embody. But as I got to work with the painting, I got to see that the movement just comes naturally, just as painting does. So I was able to look at the art interpret as best as possible and just move. There's nothing wrong with just being able to dance and be free in the movement as well as being free in the painting. I don't always necessarily need to be in a dancer mode where I'm always doing something so graceful, but there's grace in also being just a person. And there's something about that that also resonated with me within that painting. So that gives you a taste of, um, of what transpired and what's to come. And um, so we're just very briefly going to say a, a word or two about what comes next in terms of the outdoor performance, because we will be after May 6th, we'll be on May 13th um, doing a, a site specific performance of, of this work, which will be a totally different incarnation than, than these individual dances that were in the gallery. But using that material and some of the material from the Hillstead um, and the process in general, we will be placing this um, performance on the grounds of the New Britain Museum. And that will be on the 13th of May at 10.30 in the morning and six in the evening. And um, so Marcella is just gonna say a little bit about um, the, the, the ideas about the costumes for this. Um, and again, the piece is just forming and if it stops raining on Thursdays, <laughs> we're actually gonna be able to, uh, to do it. <laughs> so here's Marcella. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, one of the things that has been really exciting about this project is how you don't know which part of which is gonna inform the other. So all this work in Zoom sort of informed the way in which we shot and decided the visual framing that happened in the gallery in the same way what is going to happen in the outside of the, the museum is also informed by the experimentation that we have in Hillstead and also the experimentation that the dancer had in different landscapes or spaces. But in terms of costumes, one of the things that you saw is that I'm working with color and line inside the gallery in a more formal um, way in terms of shape and 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 color in movement, right? Creating this sculpture in movement. One of the things that I'm really interested in trying to accomplish when we go outside is to work with the idea of the mark in the paper, of the line, of the of the space on between the body. Like when you move a movement, right? You get the, the negative space here and there. So sort of when you look at the tree and you have the branches, right? So we're trying to acknowledge that and thinking the dancers as these lines 
uh, in permanent making, right? As Helen will be drawing the lines in the space and then the landscape and the colors outside become the color fields. Okay, thanks Marcella. So I think we're gonna we're gonna stop this part and open this up to questions. We'd be very. I I want to just say thank you, thank you all for coming, and also um, thanks to Helen Frankenfeller for the amazing inspiration of her work. And um, I think Min's gonna take over with. Thank you, Judy, for such a fascinating lecture. You know, from the New Britain Museum of American Art standpoint, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, to work with and to collaborate with you and your ensemble. And as much as we have, of course, been huge admirers of Helen Frankenthaler's work, I think seeing it almost seeing her work almost anew through your eyes and through um, your team's eyes has just been an educational experience for us as well. So we are so thrilled with this collaboration and partnership. We certainly hope it's the first of many more to come. I really did appreciate also your sharing, your and Marcella sharing uh, a lot of the, the thought process. Um, first of all, the body of work that you've been doing for uh, several decades, but also a new path, as you've mentioned, uh, as you encountered Helen Frankenthaler's work and getting a deeper understanding of that process uh, including the various experimentations uh, that you've been doing. I was really fascinated to hear about um, using objects as performers and the importance of space. Um, just such an, an incredible um, insight into space as a whole uh, in its three-dimensionality. Um, and I guess one of the questions that I had um, is in understanding the importance of improvisation uh, in uh, your practice and, and as we've seen throughout, um, I'm specifically curious as to what kind of a role and impact that played specific to the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, I was delighted to hear that you met your composer via Zoom, <laughs> which perhaps may not have happened uh, previously. And then, of course, um, there will be another culmination of all of these dances uh, that will be shown in a film. But I also noted uh, you were saying that uh, on a weekly basis, you and your dancers were, were reviewing um, video that had been um, taken on a weekly basis. So I'm curious what role, what impact, um, how has um, improvisation changed as, a, as an impact of COVID and, and how has that both informed the work um, that you have presented today uh, and notwithstanding the many challenges, how has it stretched you and uh, your ensemble even further in the kind of exploration of movement and work that you've been doing? Well, um, it's a great question, Min. And I think, um, first of all, the, the whole idea of the camera being in the room and using video as the means of, of, of showing what we'd, we've done, um, all these years, I've never allowed the video camera to be in the studio. Um, I felt that every that one of the skills that needs to get honed in in working in this way is how to remember what happened and not to think of it in terms of the shape initially, but to think of it in terms of the sense of you as a mover responding to what's happening in the moment, and then mm -hmm. you take yourself out of that and, and think about it in those other ways. But video makes it much easier so and and there would be intervals where someone would say well why don't we just bring the video into the room and then we can watch it afterwards and we'll see what we did and i would always say no i i think that we just need to keep that separate and um and then all of a sudden that video has become the the, the tool that we've relied on and um so I feel much more kindly towards it <laughs> in that sense. You know, I see its use, but um, I think that it also allowed, um, I mean, everybody had to learn how to video themselves and always had to be aware of the camera in order for us to see what had happened. 
But I think that it became a very useful tool. It was our survival tool. I mean, it was very, very hard on Zoom to do things in the moment and for to really be able to see them. So it afforded us that opportunity. And I think it, it, it showed us that we can keep working no matter what, in whatever ways. I think everybody really missed the um, visceral sense of and, and of each other that you know that you could pick up movement from each other and take that. So they had to rely on their own movement resources and push them push themselves harder be, because not harder but differently because there weren't people in the room to inspire them to oh there's a movement that I've never done and Rachel's doing it or Melissa's doing it or Haley's doing it and I'm going to incorporate that into my own. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was another thing. And I think just being outside and, and having, just allowing ourselves to go, each person to go so deeply. I think every one of them knows how they are all dancing differently because of this, you know, I mean, that it pushed everybody to, to, to find something more. And, um, and I think, um, and there I think is because they worked on these solos. I mean, I was there as someone giving comments, but I'm much more of an active shaper when they're in the room. So I think there's a sense that um, of these being dances that came out of this large, you know, vision that I had for this, but also being something very much that they've created. And, um, and then it becomes a whole in so many different ways. Um, so I, that I think are the main ways it has and you know the music amazing i love daniel and you know hope to work with him again in the future i mean he just did such a beautiful job so i think it just reminded me of how improvisation is i was i've been blessed to have the skill of knowing what it means because that's all that we've all had to do in this time and absolutely so, absolutely well along the lines of improvisation um you know you've talked a lot about uh, the multiple or the multiplicity of spaces that um, your ensemble uh, has been really um, taking this work from uh, the privacy of their homes um, on a solitary basis uh, and then via Zoom uh, at Hillstead, Walnut Hill Park, uh, and then eventually uh, inside the galleries. And I am curious, not only in, of course, understanding how each of those different spaces has informed um, the, the work, uh, either in an accumulative sense or varying in each venue. And ultimately, if at all, did it largely change by the time everyone was in the galleries physically with the work or um, just with smaller modifications? I mean, because, I think there's a very big difference in each of those environments, um, including the fact that uh, everyone had been seeing reproductions of the work for so long. And, and I loved hearing about um, the sort of visceral reaction everyone had physically being in the galleries. And over a period of time, you, you don't, quite um, uh, think about the dimensions as much until you're actually in the space. So um, that, um, including the juxtaposition of different work to one another, did that drastically change um, some of the, the dance uh, in, in, that, in that period of time? Yeah, I, I, that, again, a, a beautiful question. And I don't know that it, uh, I think each experience deepened the work that that continued on, you know, and I think the solos were very much an evolving thing that um, that really did change and, and transform, but held the important things that that was learned in each of those locations. It and that memory exists in the body and comes out in different ways. And I think it came out in the fullness and strength of the dancing that um, that evolved in the solos. And I think also that the the dialogue with the paintings was hugely impactful. I think the dances grew, and um, I think they um, and 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 you know Marcella and myself and 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 Kathy and PJ, the, we we benefited from that performance just on our own of seeing that that happen. Um, 
and uh, and and fortunately it was captured on film. Yeah. So I think that I mean one thing is that Rachel described in her little video that um, she changed her painting because it was in terms of filming it. Kiss, which is such a gorgeous little painting, little, um, was in a spot that, that um, well, that was, was a spot that we worked on by putting her in the doorway, but then the other painting was on the other side of Kiss, and that really, we felt there was a, um, an object in front of it that we felt would intrude, so she did change it to this larger, and that, that changed what she did. And the same for Heidi, whom you didn't see today, but hopefully um, on May. And she also had a painting that was very small and that we moved her to um, Southern Exposure, which is this very large and in the same colors as she, uh, as similar colors to what she was working with. And that really, I think also changed hers as well. I don't know, Marcel, if you have anything you wanted to add to that, but. Well, I think what you said about embodying, embodying the spaces is so true. Like the space contextually says something else, juxtaposed to them, the bodies are always telling a different story. So from the, the seeing point of view, which is the point of view that I experienced by seeing these dances, they tell you different stories of the same dance in a way that allow you to see the paint, paintings differently because by doing in these different places, but you know which painting that they're referring to, you have this relationship to the painting that's, that makes it richer, right? It makes it deeper, it makes it more elaborate. But I also think that visually, they do something really different to the eye of the person who actually experiences. So have the opportunity to, to show the work in progress and to show the different instances of the work I think is it makes um, it makes the project being deeper and richer as well. That's great, thank you. Well, so I don't want to dominate all the questions. Let me see what kind of questions have come into um, the chat. Um, I noticed that some questions um, were coming in from some of my colleagues. I think we were on the same wavelength, but um, I guess one of them was also. Um, let's see, is this the first, um, is Color Fields the first JDPP project to be inspired by visual art? Um, you know, I think that, that visual art has been a part of some investigations of topics, but it, this is the first project where it's been the focus and, and, and not visual art, but an artist, you know, a visual artist and taking in her work and also her, who she, who she, her, who she was, who Helen was. I mean, that's, that's been a, such interest to me also. So yes, this would be the first. <laughs> Great. Uh, and from Anne Sheffield, Judy, what about the dance about witches in New England? And the one about, oh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, campesinos, Mexican laborers in the fields. Okay, so we, I think that was in response to the, the pieces we were showing and, um, we didn't show the witching hour, but that was definitely a piece that we did more than once. We did it two different um, incarnations of it and um, certainly it used the visual elements. And it sort of goes to a question that came later, I think of Anne Coverley's work. Anne Coverley was a visual artist that um, collaborated with us on the witching hour. So yes, that, that, that is something. And then we never did a piece about camp, uh, Mexican campesinos, but we did do a piece and I think that may be what but you're referring to um, is of um, the Mothers of the Disappeared in Chile and Argentina. And um, that was a huge project. And I traveled to Chile and Argentina to interview the mothers and, um, and it, was, it was very, very powerful. And that is another one that, I mean, otherwise, I mean, we've been working since 1989, so we would have been here for several. <laughs> I mean, if we, if we were gonna do a sampler, it would have been too much, too much to do all. <laughs> but thank you for you know for that noticing that. I just want to have you. I'm um, oh, sorry, Marcella, go ahead. I just wanted to do a quick sideways to that because I met uh, Judy uh, around 2010, right before we did the In This House, but I am Chilean. And one of the things that, I, that brought us together to actually, she told me about that particular piece and the poems that she included in that piece. So I was, it, it was something that make us work together from the beginning. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, yeah. it's true. 
That's terrific. And I think we have time for maybe one more question before we end, which is we, we end, which has just come in. Have you thought about interacting with statues in a pub public park? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. We have worked. I mean, there are sculptures that we have, we are actually working in relation to sculptures on the New Britain Museum grounds. So in that, um, so yes to that extent, but um, not to the thought of, you know, specifically going, certainly an idea that we, we could entertain and could be quite lovely, but yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you to the Judy Dorn uh, Dance Performance Project team uh, for this incredible lecture, for our collaboration together, which we're so thrilled. Um, for all of you who have attended, thank you for uh, giving us your time. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and that we, we may see you in future forthcoming programs. Uh, please also visit the New Britain Museum of American Art and this wonderful exhibition. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you and have a good day.